Just a few quick announcements. Um, at 5.30 today, uh, you should head over to the bookstore because there's the book signing. And you can get all of your favorite authors to sign your copy. Um, and it's wonderful. I've got so many books at home on my shelf that are signed, and I love just taking them out and opening them up. And you get such a rush of memories of being here at Sewanee. Um, so I highly recommend it. And then uh, starting tomorrow, there's going to be a sign-up sheet in McClurg for um, the next two open mic readings. So sign up for those. Those are really fun. And if you want to play poker, tomorrow night there's going to be a poker game. Maybe you'll win a lot of money. And uh, that's at 10 p.m. Um, Adam Vines is coordinating that. And now please welcome Morris Manning. Hello folks, glad to see everybody, glad to be back here and very grateful for the kindness and warmth of this community. I have a new book out called The Gone and the Going Away and I'm going to just read uh, four poems from it and then I'm going to read for the rest of the time new work. I apologize, some of you may have heard uh, one or two of these. <clears throat> this is called The Complaint Against Roni Laswell's Rooster. <laughs> Attention, Mr. Roni Laswell. Roni, short for Tyrone, I hear. The hour your rooster blows for is too, too early. Another two would do. Go, speak to your rooster, Roni. <laughs> this is called the slate. I'm going to say the word two in here, and it's T-O-O. -O. I'll probably say T-O, but when I emphasize the word two, it will be T-O-O. -O. The slate. Way back, the men had funny names like Tiny who was anything but small. And Tiny's son was called Tiny Two, or Double T. And Tiny's wife, who was big and mean, was known as Honey. And everybody called Honey's sister Birdie. And Birdie, who couldn't talk, much less whistle, was beautiful, but touched in the head. So Birdie lived with them way down in Fogtown Holler, beside the green waters of Shoestring Branch. And only the land was rightly named, for it was foggy half the day down there, and the branch was skinny and whipped across the mossy roots and rocks like a snake. But by the time I came along, Tiny and Honey were already planted, and Birdie was bent over and old, and Tiny, too, was getting on and sleeping in the chicken coop with 14 chickens and a rooster named Mr. Sump. And Sump was short for something. And Tiny, too, just said he liked the company. And besides, he had to guard the chickens against Red Leg Johnny, who was a fox, because Mr. Sump was only good at making chickens. And Tiny, too, would have winked about that sort of thing. And all of this I learned at young when I was just a scratch of a boy, and I skipped down shoestring branch to Fogtown Holler and found old Tiny, too, who told me where I was from and who my people were and how they named the world around them. This is a long, rambling yarn of a poem. The last time I was happy, and I mean really, really happy. That happy? Well, let me see. It must have been inside a dream because Big Sookie was there, and she's not really real, not in the ordinary sense of real. But the parson was there, and by God, he's real, and Papa Sweets was too, and Sweets is about as real as Jesus, though Jesus, who I believe is real, wasn't in the dream unless he was in the air, a very small which is just as well because we were drunk, inebriated beyond reproach, and I doubt the Savior would have approved. So part of the dream, you see, was real, 
spun from a night of revelry in which four young revelers pursued the wild hog of life because it's fun to run a pig around. <laughs> Would that I could remember more of that stupendous chase. It's fuzzy. And I've yet to mention the presence of Hank, the only educated man among us, a pontificator and a counselor, whose, counselor, whose counsel, it turns out, would not have served us well this night because Hank had construed a wigwam from a couple of kitchen chairs, declared he wanted henceforth to be known as Rudding Elk, and then <laughs> repaired to his abode in a slump to confer, as he said, with the great spirit and sleep upon which the parson benedicted, I regret that man has but one mind to lose for his country. Bah! And then he waved his hand in holy gesture and said, Amen. Chapter and verse from scripture most obscure and strange. But the, knife, but the night itself had such a twinge, a strangeness to it, very strange. We were indeed assembled at the parsonage, but earlier we'd visited a tavern, and then another, and another, each in its way a kind of decline, the last of which was called the broken spoke and had this wagon wheel motif from which I managed to liberate a checkered tablecloth and soon had fashioned it into a cape which I sported and convinced commenced to inform the barmaid, gentle lady, I am Lord Lamour at your service and flicked the cape accordingly. Meanwhile, Sweets and the erstwhile Hank were playing cutthroat billiards with a sawed-off man who had to stand on a chair to reach the felt and who was decidedly more sober and thus a better shot and in the end a richer man who happened to brandish a longish knife. And once we'd returned to the parsonage, the parson decreed, Thou shalt not gamble with a midget. <laughs> and the heavens parted, and the parson's beard quivered in the holy wind. Ah, the wind! This very tale has gotten windy. Let us strive to wind it down. Following Hank's foray with the great spirit in the kitchen chairs, Sweets announced he was so hungry he could eat the nether end of a skunk and proceeded to fry some crackers in water to abate his hunger. But in a cloud I saw him whirl before the skillet and kiss his fingers magnifique. He sighed in continental praise and tipped an imaginary hat for the compliment he'd paid himself. Sweets was in love with his dream and why not? Shouldn't a dream be a dream after all? From love to love, a fanciful path, love lit and impossible. That's the kind of dream I have. What's wrong with being happy there? But back to the true account of this tale. As Sweets performed his gastronomy, the parson tossed a nightcap down and said, Thy will be done, I'm done, and promptly transformed himself into what could only be described as the carcass of some fantastic beast found in tapestries from the Middle Ages, minus the horns, and surrendered himself to the kitchen floor in close locale to the pale and drooling rutting elk. And all at once, my dream began. The door to the pantry teetered open and there she stood, big sookie, about 11 feet tall, and bathed in glowing light and clad, in fact, for bathing or something near it. And she emerged, smiling. Let's go, she said. I'm going to pack you home, but when I get you home, look out. <laughs> Being a gentleman, I bid Papa Sweets bon appetit and wrapped my cape around the lass, and we departed into the balm of the summer night like dewdrops. Sookie took my arm as we crossed the hill, the village winking behind us. Oh, loveliest village of the plain, seat of my youth. 
etc. And Suki hummed a little song. But under the gaze of the stars, I paused and looked Big Sookie in the eye. I'm happy I invented you, I said. Me too, she said. Me too. So another little short one, the last of these I'll read. The Two Crows in the Autumn Field. Get over here with us, flathead, the near crow said inflected with cause. We need three. You, Blackie, and me. Go pigeon-toed and sulky. That's it. Good. Sulkier. Good. <laughs> now, these are very different, I think. I hope, so. I hope they are. It would be a real waste of time if they aren't. <laughs> These are shorter and denser, perhaps. Some are sonnet-like creatures, and some are about a page or so. Fine as a frog's hair split three ways. Committed pessimists are those who like it when it's worse than ever and might get worser still. They hold a hope it might get worser. It could, but if it didn't, that could be construed as even worse. And that could make a worser man's eyes glitter with happiness. My uncle was one of these, a man on the side of worser. If someone asked him, Ike, his given name was Isaac, how's it going? His answer was, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> to what's the good word, he'd happily shake his head. Don't know it. <laughs> Pause for a cause. It's what we used to take, call taking a break at certain jobs. Pause for a cause. When after studying for a while the floor, someone says, well, and stops, the next movement then is to clap his thigh and lifting his face as if someone has seen inside his mind the trouble or question he's holding there. He gets up out of the chair on the porch and goes back to loosening the ground and turning it with a hoe. The rest was jarring. It shook him out of time. I've done that kind of staring after an afternoon of work and gone back. But which is more abstract? The staring or the work? or the empty cup on the rail. This is called an old saying. Who said it now? I'm never sure, though being eleven or so is plain among the sparse furnishings of memory conjured by the dream. My being there to hear it is like recalling a hook above the sink and a stiffened rag hanging from it. Either it was Mrs. Sparrow, a woman on my paper route, whose son was left lame and remote, who couldn't speak his name without her eyes going watery. It was her or my grandmother, for both had minds marked by grief as if there were a pencil held until the sharpener wore it down to a nub to make thought clarified by blunt feeling. No abstractions. It was a saying about a war. 
It can't be helped and it can't be stopped. Such a plain, unreflective saying. Which war this was, I don't recall. Jack Sparrow had been in one. My father had been in another one. But I don't know why at 11, something about sorrow pierced me and one of the women said it, perhaps in answer to a question I'd asked, perhaps as a kind of comforting that children should let such questions go. But a man was also there standing beside a row of hay bales tipped over the edge of a hill so only the square ends of the bales could be seen. I wondered if they had fallen neatly off the wagon to be counted and if the man was counting them. It wasn't a barn where they were going. I believe the man was Mr. Temple and he was wearing a suit coat the way old farmers used to do. He was calling me over to him to help him count. And then, because the dream was so calm and slowly turning, I heard another voice, another saying, Fighting is hard on old clothes. Like that, from out of nowhere but my mind, remembering inside the spooky, drifting lull of the dream. I can see myself sitting across the cluttered room from Mrs. Sparrow, the sling of papers hanging still on my shoulder, and she is going on about Crab Orchard, the little town where she was raised. In the old days, there had been a healing mineral springs. When she was keen to express delight, my grandmother had a saying, Well, I declare, she would say, as if she were making an apology. Well, I declare those butter beans are just about the finest thing I've ever set down on a plate. So I declare about my dream with three voices I knew and a fourth and sayings I have listened to. It was a populated dream and there were ridges rolling through it and trees in the green time of the year. This is called What's Going On in the Hinterlands. It feels pretty good to be back in the groove, hobnobbing with birds in the general world, and this includes tadpoles a-trickling their little tails. My observation on this is the wiggling exactly matches the chitter-chattery blurts of several birds in terms of rhythm. And at night, some trilling bugs I hear keep the same time. And before I know it, there goes my foot, like water dripping off an eave. I expect to have further reports about the system of the world, if you want to call it that. My Aunt Fanny. What do you think of the tale bandied about? The grandly elevated tale that's used to justify the unimaginable and therefore the not so true. A tale that says we must do something now or else. And it turns out the bravest plan is to do what we've already been doing, only we must do it more. The consequences will be bad, they say. It could be anyone who not so innocently tugs this line of thought. It's how we arrive at thinking we have no other choice a position that requires a kind of evidence inventively employed. And once the dreadful thing we could have stopped occurs, we say, we've learned our lesson now and never again, etc. And then around it comes another tale 
perhaps a plain and wrenching one. It will be said a mother bird must feed her young, but that won't keep the snake from sliding to her nest. A nice analogy with symbols that says we do what we do because it's natural and necessary to be afraid. To which I, who believe in nature and have studied it and even seen a mother bird push a weakling from the nest without the merest shred of grief, I say in nature nothing is inevitable. It's one surprise followed by another, and all of it is true. Imagine that. And anyone who thinks it could be otherwise will always be a destroyer and my enemy. <clears throat> Monotheism in Kentucky present time. <laughs> I'm from Kentucky, so I'll... I thought of beginning this utterance by saying, I had to, a taste today of pure joy, but on second thought I'm tired of purity and now prefer mistakes. That's it. I made a mistake today in tending the garden and spreading straw around the green, encouraging the peas to climb. I was, in short, enjoying it, and naked to the waist was I. And then it rained, and I kept on working, believing I was giving God a hand. And then I thought, what kind of idiot thinks he's helping God? <laughs> <laughs> History. A vine, ironically, I found, that had wound around a tree and climbed into the bloom above until I couldn't distinguish it from the tree, except to see it had reached beyond and twisted merely the air before something convinced it farther to reach another tree, which I thought should be an argument against the claim of following an instinct, because the superficial vine was bound like a lie how greenly it turned around the more important tree. And then I saw the other vine that had climbed the first and twined together the two so spitefully it seemed human. And the tree from being clung to how else but desperately reminded me of God or how I thought of God when I was first imagining and seeing when I closed my eyes in the rocking chair and the lullaby was sung the other side of sleep and thinking how will I get there if that lonesome looking place is heaven which dare I say it pleases me the original loneliness above wherever it's supposed to be though it's probably a wrong conception. This is called translation. So I came out of my rainy bower covered with white petals dropped from a tree. My people long ago, whose milky eyes I still can see, would have said I had a God's plenty of petals on me. An expression I liked to hear as a boy because I knew it pointed out the obvious only to make it just like that completely something else. But those people are gone away from the world. 
so I had to say it myself. The gods plenty of petals that fell when the little rain came down and I happened to be under the tree. I have no idea what plenty is to God, but it stings my heart to know that someone thought about it once probably after a day's work when he was staring at a lantern or sitting on a porch to watch the stars enumerate themselves and struggling to find the words to catch it all, then finding them. This is called You, Y-O-U. You were not alone when you thought you were. You had a kind of ghost, all right, invisible and silent, but he put a lot of things in your heart, some admittedly fuzzy and some utterly blank before you knew they were there. Then they arrived, usually one at a time, like a bird lighting on a branch. Didn't you like it secretly, singing along to a tragedy, your gloom, then marveling at something marvelous and green? That's where you were wrong. It was miraculous. Soup. I had a few potatoes once that I'd set aside to use for seed, but I was hungry and I thought resourceful. So I cut out the eyes with an old knife, hoping to save a few for spring. Left on the board, irregular and jagged, they looked like a map of countries, one split off from another following some dispute. I was poor and doing different jobs back then and dreaming what I might be, as if what I was were nothing yet. And I was reading and listening and going into the woods at night. The potatoes I cut into smaller pieces and dropped them into the cook pot with about a gallon of water, some pepper, and the little bit of salt I had. I lit the fire and let it cook, simmering it for hours. I called it soup, and I wanted it to last. Feather pillow. My great grandmother long ago made chicken made from chicken feathers pillows, at least the one I have in blue and gray ticking. On the farm, the home place we call it, near the mingled farms and the country store composing a village called Plato. She was poor but I recall steady, more faithful than she was religious. When locust leaves flutter down in September, I think they look like feathers. Her name was Miranda. All of this, I call it slow knowledge. There I lay, sometimes unsettled, my head. This is called rain. I really don't like going into my own mind to sit there alone with my so-called thoughts, my wonderings, 
my four or five or however many now it is griefs I can never explain or resolve, if all I do is fiddle around thinking I have an idea or now know what to say about something. I'd rather go out of my mind to let something else come in, like rain and the sound of rain splattering on leaves in the sanity of the woods where nothing is alone, not even the rackety wren, the real creation. In the old days of cars and trucks, they had a vent window in the front door on either side. There was the little triangular window that had a latch. Some of you young folks, this is before your time. I'm, I'm helping edify your historical knowledge. <clears throat> this is called Fixed It With a Nickel. When I was still in school, not quite 16, I worked with a little man named Floyd, delivering heavy goods for the hardware store. About half the time, he said, the devil had a hold of him. The other half of time, the Lord was the one who had the hold. He'd get with one for a while before the other one would grab him back. <laughs> Was he ever on his own, I asked. <laughs> Not tugged or torn by anything. No in-between for me, he said. We had to go to Boneyville one winter day, a long ride back then, to take a heating stove to a man who I remember had a porch with four or five tall steps. The steps were steeper than a ladder. The old man stood at the top and grinned as we struggled with the dead weight. The vent window in the truck whistled all the way out, so we talked loudly. But coming back, we wanted quiet, and Floyd wedged a shim of wood behind the latch, and the whistle stopped. I hadn't thought about that trick for years until I had to fix a whistle myself. But I didn't have a shim nearby. This time I fixed it with a nickel. Crutch. That was another sign of not doing something right, to read with your finger following along, and worse, to read the passage out loud. We weren't supposed to hear the words or, fear, or feel them coming out of our mouths. If we read like that, we were using a crutch. I used to imagine a face behind my eyes and there I could see a mouth pronouncing the words, and it made a voice I could listen to. That's how I read. And we weren't supposed to count on our fingers, so I hid my hands in my lap and tapped on my thighs or the underside of the desk as if I were playing an instrument. But I was counting carrying over the tens from the column of ones, or when I needed to add another eight to 64, I'd tap it out because I could only go so far doing my times from memory. There was something wrong if you used your fingers to count, and most of the children I knew who did learned either to hide it or eventually how to stop counting. Um, this is called Tin Penny and it refers to the size of a nail. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tin Penny nail is about three and a half inches long. 
ten penny. I like looking at something strange, like a nail driven crookedly and bent into a hard plank in the barn with the head sort of lolling over and stiff. It's strange to be sticking pain plainly out of the order of the barn and to have a singular countenance. But the barn itself, on the whole, is not so rational. It has a significant uphill lean, which I admire or regard as I would a statue in a church with a sad and still compassionate face looking out. Whoever drove the nail got it only to go so far before it bent. And then he hit it again and further bent it. Whoever it was who drove the nail and stopped had tried to be precise and notably failed and left the failure there to see. After considering this, I still oppose perfection or reaching it and still believe in trying to. That is what I meant by strange. That is why I'm leaving the nail where it is as if I had driven it myself. Why I am not a Stoic. By now I've seen it all, the weird, translucent yellow spider hauling her pale pearl of eggs, or the spores of the reddish fungus fuming out from its half-inch smokestack in the moss, and even the damp shade commencing with the woods and seeming like water steadily to flow away. How these go unattended. An observation so smug and pithy I ought to take it back. But I mean it as a fact, as a starting point in case a philosophical moment arrives. It would suit me if it didn't because a philosophy based on shade or moss would be difficult to prove. I've made a claim the appearance of something that seems singular, but probably isn't. And that, an irony observed in what I thought was solitude. But I was never alone in the shade. I had the shade, and the moss inside it, and the poof of spores, and the yellow spider, swinging back and forth like a bulb in a room with someone listening to nothing or a bug flicking against the black pane of the window. We have a form inside a form inside a mesmerizing form. I'm itching to say something nice about it. It's pleasantly slow and may appeal to objectivity but maybe not. Let's let it be nighttime now, up there in the dome of contemplation. No light, no need to have a light. Let's give it a rest. Let's say, good night, you little idea. Here. It's hard to figure out how long. The truth at Three Lick Creek. Below the ridges, dim and low, the hollows and narrow valleys run, and pools of water prove a stream has been there once. Standing before a pool like these, Painted with leaves dropped from the trees, I now believe a mind conceived this place and thought it must be sunken down and save the birds and wind and other sounds belonging to it, it must be quiet. 
and let the truth of this be as plain as a dead leaf, the mind has said. We'll bring a boy down here one day and see if he can handle it. called slain in the spirit concerning hell I have believed at times it should be pointed out divined to its oblivion by something small a fall flower risen like a blue rod in silence and near to hiding itself within the yellowing dominant mass seeming to claim the bank of the stream if it weren't true that blue is now in fall apparently defiant as if someone underground attending blue lanterns has turned one up so there you have it anyone who wants to hold back hell someday little gray feather tinged with red or blood. I don't know what to think standing at the bottom of the hill in the woods. The bare trees reach up. The hill is to my right and on the left begins another steeper hill. We call this a hollow, as if this place were empty. I like such irony. It won't explain itself, and here is nothing explicable. We make comparisons to it, but not the other way around, except to say the foot of the hill, the head of the hollow. Usually we say a man has cavernous eyes to say the eyes mean more, and the man himself becomes more fundamentally defined. Someone could come here and learn nothing. I was raised to think God was involved with this. No, I wasn't raised that way. It was my idea all along. I found it all by myself standing in the woods when I was a boy, merely a boy looking up at the trees or down at a feather dropped in the grass, a feather representing both itself and the bird and even more at once, as if it were an art. I'll read two more. <clears throat> My treasure. I used to hear from people who we used to say were chipper because they gave off a positive outlook on life and pleasantly smiled a lot and made me think they were ever kind. From that position, I'd hear them praise the so-called dignity of the poor as if being poor was virtuous. But then I noticed while carefully painting the pickets of a fence or working in silence except for the gritty ring of the hoe mincing the ground. The people who made such claims weren't speaking from experience. I remember working for next to nothing as a boy for people who expected me to work that way. I resented that in time. But now, in farther time, as if time is a distance, I realize I was learning then to be polite to liars. Perhaps to people who had no idea they were lying and didn't even know that shadow inside themselves was loneliness. But I was rich on that. It took me many years to see it clearly, but I was practically a king. And then I became a poet and have a world to write about, lies to depose, and ambiguities to leave lingering in the air like smoke from a candle just blown out. 
Last one. Love poem for my wife who just left. She's, she's heard it. <clears throat> the dry vine from a kind of weed whose yield is pods is being flung out senselessly by the wind and a scrap of the vine at that. The part still curled around the cedar branch, its host, with a kite tail hanging down, and one of the pods is open like a heart on a paper valentine from school I used to get and used to make by folding the paper in half and turning it around the scissors, mostly for friendship or to do what everybody else would do. But the hearts I made were always off. This one, fluttering from the vine that's fastened to the branch of the tree, was full of seeds that floated away in the fall. Then winter happened to it. And there it is, just hanging there, as if someone tied it to the branch and the vine had no decision in it. Thank you.